My name is George Ola and I study macaws here in Tambopata for about seven years now. When I first came to Tambopata, I started to study the nest preferences of two large macaw species, the scarlet macaws and the red and green macaws here at the Tambopata Research Center. And later I continued my uh, studies as a PhD about the population genetics of the same species. For the studies about the nest preferences, of course we need to climb these nests and need to take different measurements like how high they are, uh, what kind of nests they are, like PVC, wooden or natural nest, what are the depths, the measure of the entrance, etc. And we also take uh, data about what species nest in different years in those nests and how many eggs they lay, how many chicks hatch and then eventually how many fledged at the breeding season. So, Having enough data, enough breeding seasons, we can conclude what kind of nest these species prefer so we can provide or suggest the best artificial nest design for them in the future. For the genetic studies, I need to go out to the field, not just around TRC, but also in the different river system here in Tambopata. I need to find the major clay leaks and go there regularly and collect feather samples from that that can serve as a DNA sample from those species. And I also uh, look for nests and take uh, blood samples from the chicks. So once I have all this data of the region, I can analyze them in a laboratory and using genetic uh, markers I can answer questions about the population genetics for example what's the genetic diversity uh, what's the status of different populations how isolated they are from each other even estimating population sizes using these genetic techniques Macaws are secondary cavity nesters which means they occupy big hollows in large uh, emergent canopy trees. So right now we are in a 40 meters high canopy tower uh, at the Tambopata River, which is just at the canopy level of the forest. The trees are usually between uh, 30, 40, 50 meters high. This tower is about 40. So we are gonna try uh, a drone uh, to locate uh, new nests around here. The Tambo Patamaka project in TRC has been going on more than 20 years. So you would think that we know for now everything about macaws, but that's not really true. We just get more and more information, but we also get more and more questions as we develop. So future research could be uh, done about their movements, and there's already an ongoing research about in their uh, movement, uh, tracking them with the satellite telemetry techniques and could also involve other research that would reveal more about their natural history because again here in Tambopata it's a very unique place where we can study these birds while still in a healthy living ecosystem in the Tambopata Basin. Hello everyone, my name is George Ola from Wildlife Messengers. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that little introductory video uh, about my work in the Peruvian Amazon. Now I'm here in a bit different jungle. I'm calling in from Budapest, Hungary. Um, by the way, if you liked the video, you can, it's part of a, a short documentary uh, mini series uh, that we made uh, at Wildlife Messengers. Uh, it's called uh, Fieldwork in the Peruvian Amazon, and it showcases the uh, research of not just um, mine, but other researchers in Tambopata. Uh, we made this uh, short documentary in collaboration with the Peruvian government and Rainforest Expeditions, a local ecotourism company in Peru. Uh, and you can watch the whole series on our YouTube channel, which is YouTube slash Wildlife Messengers. So 
Today, I would like to uh, talk about uh, a little bit about my work, although you probably already heard uh, my introductory talk uh, a few days ago uh, when I was talking about the status of uh, parrots um, in a global perspective. Uh, but today, I would like to talk a little bit more about uh, my work uh, in Peru and also my involvement in um, different uh, 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 film production, nature production, um, uh, videos, documentaries, uh, video abstracts, and so on. And I would also like to show you some of our, our work that we've done, just like the first video that you just saw. Um, so as you've seen already in the video, I, um, I worked in Tambopata in southeastern Peru uh, for uh, more than a decade now. And uh, my work mainly focused on the, uh, on the breeding ecology of large macaws, but also uh, on the uh, genetics, uh, did lots of genetic uh, work out there. And um, my uh, supervisor was uh, Dr. Donald Brightsmith uh, at the Tambopata Research Center. His project helped a lot in um, uh, during all the field work um, that is now called his project is the, the Macau Society. And they continue work um, in the Tambopata region uh, and doing lots of interesting and diverse research on macaws. Uh, so my main interest uh, was uh, studying the, the large macaws and the population genetics in that area that wasn't really uh, well known. And uh, uh, our main source of research uh, samples were uh, just actually collecting uh, lots of lots of feather samples from the so-called clay licks or colpas. And uh, those places held us uh, a lot to, to acquire lots of uh, genetic samples from, uh, from these uh, specific um, uh, locations. Um, so we published uh, already most of that uh, research in scientific publications, uh, but now I would like to show you uh, not the paper itself, but uh, a video that we made uh, one of our results um, in uh, conservation genetics, uh, namely about how we use this information, how we process the data, the, the feather samples that we found uh, in the field in the Peruvian Amazon, uh, what we did with them uh, after taking back to the laboratory uh, and what kind of uh, information we, uh, we gained uh, from, from those genetic samples. So let's watch uh, this uh, short video. This is just a few minutes and then I'm gonna be right back with you. The first problem faced by this project was how do you actually sample uh, the DNA of these birds and birds are tricky to catch at the best of times, but macaws in the tropical rainforest are extremely difficult to catch. The study was centered in the Peruvian Amazon, where these birds are abundant and visit the so-called clay licks to consume soils rich in sodium. When we just observe the birds, we can't tell them apart, so we can count how many birds are at one point in the clay lick, but we don't know how many exactly, uh, how many individuals visiting and revisiting the clay licks every day. And uh, what the team developed was essentially forensic analysis of macaws. For the genetic studies, I need to go out to the field, not just around TRC, but also in the different river system here in Tambopata. I need to find the major clay licks and order regularly and collect feather samples. During our study, we collected more than a thousand feather samples from two different species, from scarlet macaws and red and green macaws. But what was particularly worrying for us in this project was what would happen in a tropical environment where there's a lot of rain, very high humidity, and they're the very conditions that make uh, DNA um, degrade very quickly. So we were really thrilled to find that the feathers were able to protect the DNA and uh, allow us to get good quality DNA for this analysis. Essentially, we were able to take a 
blood from a feather and do a DNA analysis of that just like we do in a forensic lab from a blood splatter. Our study used non-invasive genetic tagging in combination with marker capture modeling to infer demographic information for the red and green macaw. By collecting these feathers from the clay leaks, we can actually tell them apart which individuals they're coming from. We find that one clay leak had an average of uh, 100 or 200 uh, red and green macaws visiting per season, which is actually a new finding. The finding that the, the birds are genetically very similar across the lowland does suggest that uh, they have uh, very capable of quite long distance dispersal, that there's interconnections between the populations, and that if you can maintain a large, healthy uh, area of rainforest, then uh, there's every chance that these birds will, will be with us for a long, long time. This was indeed a very exciting uh, research, uh, part of my uh, PhD research uh, done at the Australian National University. And I really wish I were at Tambo Water right now, and hopefully I can go back soon. Uh, maybe some of you been already at uh, the Tambo Water Reserve in Southeastern Peru, it's actually quite near to Cusco. If you visited uh, Machu Picchu, you probably also went to Tambopata. By the way, uh, the Tambopata National Reserve was established um, in uh, September of 2000. So uh, it just uh, celebrated its 20th anniversary uh, this month. Um, and I'm writing like an article series about Tambopata the issues uh, in Tambopata, like the gold mining, uh, the research that I've done there in the last decade and uh, the, the future uh, of the region as well. So you can find those articles on our website, which is uh, wildlifemessengers.org and the article sections. And uh, a bit later, I'm gonna talk about what this wildlife messengers exactly is, but first, um, just going back to the to the, the, the genetic research that I've done in Tambopata. So it was very useful indeed to, to find out uh, more about these uh, birds, uh, especially the scarlet macaws and, uh, and the green winged macaws uh, living uh, in the wild in Tambopata, because it's really hard to, to, to get any information uh, about them unless you really capture them. Uh, tag them, for example, put a, a band, and then when you recapture, you can register that this is the same bird or a different bird. And uh, this is actually how um, many ecological research can estimate the, the population size of uh, not only birds, but some other animals as well. So in this genetic research, we didn't have to, to capture them and tag them. We only had to collect the genetic materials, and as was mentioned in the in this uh, video, um, we just uh, use this genetic mark recapture technique uh, by just sequencing the 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 uh, the genetics of uh, of each uh, feather samples, which uh, we could check whether uh, it's coming from the same individual or different individuals. And based on this information, uh, we could calculate like uh, the estimated population size of a clay leak. Uh, which uh, is about like a few hundreds up to a thousand birds. Uh, we also saw that like more closely related individuals visit um, a single clay lick and they don't really move in between uh, clay licks, so they usually just return to the same one. But we also find that uh, sometimes we recovered uh, a sample, uh, I mean like one individual's samples uh, in, at a different clay lick. Uh, later on. So they do go around and do visit other clay leaks, but they usually have a preference uh, for a single clay leak, and usually uh, near to the one they nest. 
Um, the other interesting thing was that, uh, as Rod Pickle, my other supervisor, mentioned in the video, that we didn't really find like a big genetic uh, difference uh, between those populations in Tambopata. So Tambopata, if you've been there or seen uh, some uh, videos or, or, or photos about them, you, you saw that this is uh, a lowland rainforest. And uh, mockups can like really be found in most most of the most of the national reserve. But there's also a national park. It's uh, right uh, adjacent to to the to the reserve, and it's called uh, the Bawahe Sonene National Park, which extends not only Madre de Dios but uh, all the way to Puno. And Puno is already uh, kind of a highland. If you go uh, the the you, you can approach the, the Andes mountain. So uh, there's already like a, 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 a cloud forest if you go closer to, to Puno. And uh, one of our other sites of research uh, was actually in the Bawahesson and National Park, uh, namely this uh, valley, Intermountain Valley or a basin, it's called Kandamu. And, um, so we also collected samples from there and uh, no one has collected genetic samples from macaws uh, from that uh, valley so we had no idea what we actually gonna find and uh, and we actually find out later on of course when we analyzed the, the dna in the lab that those populations of macaws uh, within the, the Kandamo Valley was really significantly different from the genetically from the population from the lowland Tambopata uh, region. And uh, the question raises why, what, what, uh, why is this different? What, what's uh, isolating those uh, Makal uh, populations from each other? And uh, um, this is another uh, study we published uh, later on. And we also made a, a short video. Uh, this was in collaboration with uh, Dr. Greg Asner um, from the Global Airborne Observatory. Uh, they had uh, information uh, of the region by, by flying over with the uh, uh, Airborne Observatory, which is basically a plane that records a very detailed map with a, a, a LiDAR system uh, on the plane. Uh, so this laser detection system uh, builds very detailed maps of the region and records data like uh, the canopy height, the carbon density in the region, uh, or uh, the, the topographic height of the, of the mountains. So let's check out this uh, video as well and see what we actually found in collaboration uh, with these scientists. Dispersal is essential for species survival and landscape genetic studies are valuable tools for identifying potential barriers to dispersal. The Amazon Basin is a highly diverse and globally important ecosystem, which is facing threats in the form of rapid changes such as continual development of highways and gold mining. We've been studying macaws for decades in the Peruvian Amazon, gaining insights into their breeding biology, natural diet, ecology, parasitology, and population dynamics. All of these can play important parts in their conservation. Macaws have been studying the Peruvian rainforest for several decades, uh, revealing lots about their biology, but we know very little about their genetics and even less about their dispersal. I went to southeastern Peru to study the population genetics of scarlet macaws in a huge area of continuous primary rainforest. Over several years, we collected hundreds of feather samples from these birds from different landscapes, and after extracting their DNA, we reconstructed the genetic structure of the population. We collected remote sensing data with the Carnegie Airborne Observatory using our high resolution laser scanning system called a LIDAR. Later, we took the LiDAR data and processed it to give us three-dimensional structure of the Amazon forest canopy. This gave us tree height, and then we further processed it with satellite data 
mainly radar and optical data, to estimate the above ground carbon density of the forest. We also used our maps to develop uh, information on the elevation uh, of the ground as well as the water surfaces throughout the region. Based on these high resolution maps, we constructed different models of landscape resistance between each genetic sample using circuitscape, a method that's based on the theory of electrical circuits. And then we tested for correlations between these different habitat features and the current population genetic structure of macaws to explore natural barriers to their movement across this landscape. We found that macaws were genetically very similar across the landscape that we studied, except in the inter-mountain valley called Kandamo, where they showed some important genetic differences. The landscape resistance models revealed that genetic distance between these individuals was related to elevation. This suggests that high elevation probably act as a natural barrier to scarlet macaws and hence limit their gene flow. In another study, we showed that parrot species worldwide are severely affected by the problems caused by growing human populations. This study is very important because it gives us important baseline data uh, that tells us how the birds respond to natural barriers in their natural habitat and that will help us understand much better the impacts of growing human populations in the Amazon basin. So with this video, I wanted to show you and demonstrate how important it is in research uh, to collaborate with uh, scientists from different disciplines, uh, so which means an interdisciplinary uh, research project, um, because uh, each of those scientists can uh, contribute with their data or their, uh, their knowledge uh, about the topic, and then uh, new knowledge can be generated or we can find um, uh, new things that we could not have uh, found just by looking at only the genetics, for example, in this case, uh, or only the, the landscape uh, of Kandamu. So we really needed to have that element from the, from the genetics and, and then from the, uh, from the airborne observatory with the, the LiDAR data. Um, and uh, combining this information, we, we could find out like new information about these uh, macaws and hopefully uh, we can contribute to the protection as well, highlighting that how important that really is uh, that population in, in the Kandamo Valley and, um, and how important it is to, to keep it protected within the national park because uh, it wasn't always the case. And I'm just gonna get back to that uh, thought in a, in a minute. Uh, just wanted to mention that with these short videos, which are called video abstracts, we try to summarize um, the results, uh, the information of uh, quite complicated scientific uh, publications and, and uh, um, make it m available to the general public in a more understandable way. Um, uh, and we put it up to uh, YouTube so you can find uh, uh, our other research uh, published uh, in scientific journals as well in, uh, on YouTube. Uh, it's YouTube slash Wildlife Messengers and you can also find these all uh, collected together, uh, all the, the video abstracts we made um, at wildlifemessengers.org slash science. So Back to uh, back to Kandamu and Stambopata, uh, that was a really uh, a very very special place in Kandamu, and and uh, a very few research projects has been uh, conducted in Kandamu before because it's like so remote and so hard to access. Uh, even from the Tambopata Research Center, it's a few days up a river, and the and TRC is already uh, more than a day. Uh, uh, away from Puerto Maldonado, the closest, uh, the closest town. So all these years um, that I've done research in the field uh, in Tambopata, Candamo, and in the Peruvian Amazon, uh, I also 
uh, like to to film that we are doing there, film the, the environment, the the, the mocos, uh, the research that we are doing. And a very good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Cynthia Garai, uh, who is also from Budapest, Hungary, and uh, we finished university together here. Uh, we graduated at the University of Veterinary Sciences at Budapest back in 2006. Uh, so she she's a primate researcher, but she really likes uh, the, the the thing that I also like in science communication and bringing all these uh, information, uh, the research, the conservation to the general public. So she visited me uh, many times uh, during my research in Peru. And she's also uh, a, a, wildlife, uh, uh, a wildlife filmmaker. So she had experience in filming uh, in the wild, uh, in Africa mainly, and also in Hungary. And so she, she accompanied my research in uh, these re remote locations in the Peruvian Amazon. And uh, she also filmed a lot of our research, how we climb trees, how we collect all these samples uh, in, uh, in Tambopata and in Candamo. So, but we didn't really have like a specific idea uh, of what to do with those uh, footage. And we just had lots of lots of footage until we, after a few years later, we, we realized that we should really do something uh, with that important footage. And uh, by that time we had uh, uh, an idea of, uh, you know, a better understanding of what's going on in the region, not just like scientifically, like the, about the research, about the macaws, we could now tell a story about uh, our finding, but also all the, the other issues in, uh, in the region, uh, like the gold mining that was already mentioned in one of these videos. Uh, and uh, for example, the, the, the oil extraction uh, that also uh, was a big threat to Kandamu uh, a few years before I first arrived to, uh, to that region. And so we really wanted to show uh, like uh, not only showcase the region and why it's, it's so important, but all the issues that it's facing. And we also wanted to like uh, present some kind of solution, uh, some down to earth uh, uh, solution with, with, uh, with a film. And then we, we had this idea like, oh, maybe we should uh, make a documentary about Tambopata and uh, the research we've done about uh, the ecotourism that's, uh, uh, you know, being uh, uh, done there for many, many years, decades in Tambopata, the, the, the Maka project, uh, and also the involvement of the, the local community, uh, the Eseja community of Infierno. So uh, when all these little puzzles uh, fall into, into their places, uh, we came up with an idea, okay, let's make a documentary and let's call it the Maka project. And uh, so we had all the, the footage already, uh, the videos, uh, the raw materials to make, but you know, uh, making a film, a uh, documentary, it's not cheap. Uh, it's, uh, the, uh, there's a big part of the budget to actually go there and film and record and you know, the, the, uh, the salary of, of all those people. Well, we already had that one sorted because we, we, we mainly done that uh, as part of the research and as a volu uh, volunteer work uh, of our own, uh, using our own equipment, etc. But uh, even that, after we have the raw material, it's a, it's a lot of money to make a documentary because uh, then comes everything that's called the post-production stage. So there's lots of editing involved and, and you know, that's not free work. Uh, there's also the computer time that it's a, it's a big investment, all the, uh, all the programs that you need to use uh, to edit these videos, uh, all the different uh, uh, copyright like to, to make the, the license for the music that you use. So th these are all not free material. And then, uh, you know, just uh, having experts on, um, on the documentary and, uh, and putting everything together. So it's, it's a big work and you can, we, we couldn't really done that in our just free work. So we had this idea 
and this was around 2000 and, and uh, um, probably it was 2012 already, I, I think, uh, when, we, when we thought, let's make um, crowdfunding. And, um, and we made one on Indiegogo and uh, we made like a short trailer about the issues and what we want to, to make. And I would like to show you that trailer that actually uh, was very, very successive. And we had lots of lots of support and maybe some of you uh, already uh, uh, contributed to, to make the documentary because uh, the, the fundraising was really successful. So let's check out that uh, video uh, trailer of the mock-up project. George is climbing up to the nest now. We just caught the male. So we just captured an adult scarlet macaw, a male who'd been, um, he actually had, had a transmitter put on him last year. So we were replacing the transmitter. And we also do measurements where we measure the beak, the wings, the tarsus, yeah. and the tail. So this documentary was completed in 2016 and now it's available on many other languages, not only English, but also Spanish, Portuguese, Hungarian, Polish on uh, different on-demand platforms. So you can check it out on our website. Uh, that's wildlifemessengers.org uh, slash Maka movie. 
And <clears throat> after this documentary, recognizing the, the big interest of people in this kind of uh, conservation documentaries, uh, uh, people who already knew us, uh, with Cynthia Garay, we established Wildlife Messengers and uh, Cynthia is right here with us. Um, and I would like, yep, yeah, here she is. Hi, Cynthia. Hi, so you already saw Cynthia's uh, presentation uh, earlier, uh, I think last week. And so we established Wildlife Messengers with her and the third member, Robert Caruva. Uh, and so what is this, Cynthia? So this is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, right, in registered yeah. in the US. Yeah, so we established, I mean, you know that, but we are still, <laughs> I'm gonna tell that to the audience, that uh, we established Wildlife Messengers because we saw that um, there are amazing wildlife documentaries, but mostly they are made for they are made for the general public, the wide audience, wide public. And we wanted, we realized that that uh, there is a great potential also to talk to to specific target audiences and to to convey them specific messages and uh, solutions to different problems. And uh, these target audiences could be decision makers, for example. Or, or local communities or institutions and uh, and obviously if you make a film you have to to make completely it completely different uh, you have to write it in a different way and use different visual uh, motifs or visual visual stuff in the film uh, when you talk to the decision makers or when you talk to the local communities or when you talk to the white public. Sometimes we, we make also films for the white public, like in this case, the Indonesian Parallel Project, that's what we did. But um, but we want more and more to also talk to specific audiences. So that's, that's the idea behind it. And we both scientists, so uh, we, we had this special access to, to the places uh, like, uh, you know, in case of Tambo Pata, uh, where we researched in, in places that it's not really readily re accessible to anyone or any film crew and, and methods and, and uh, interesting technology to film. I remember when we filmed in, in Lima as well, in the laboratory. Yeah, uh, before the establishment of Wildlife Messengers, actually. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that was all before. And uh, it really helped us a lot to see this attention with the Macau project uh, from people and you know the donations that people donated their money for this cause and and um, and now that we have this non-profit charity I think it's even easier for people especially I think in the US to, to donate for for a, for a public charity uh, mm -hmm. like like this one and and we want to continue this uh, and uh, um, not, not only Macau's but many other Films and we had uh, quite a few films since the Macau project. Um, so all that you can find on our website, which we have now, uh, the wildlifemessengers.org. And uh, and yeah, so what happened after after the Macau uh, project? I remember that we got some other support uh, from. Hungary, right? The Hungarian Media Council. Yeah, that was for the Indonesian Power Project. Exactly. But before before that, I, I remember we started a collaboration, you know, with uh, with the uh, Film Jungle uh, Studio and Film Jungle Society, and mm -hmm. um, we got also a support uh, from the Hungarian Media Council to, to actually continue this uh, this project uh, and uh, and film more in and that was like already in Kandamo when when we went uh, to Kandamo. Okay. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And, yeah, and also the Peruvian government uh, got a grant for science communication from them <clears throat> when we filmed the, the first video that I showed to the audience uh, about the yeah. field work in the Peruvian Amazon. But uh, what I, I would like to show them now is the, the second uh, movie that we made about Tambo Pata and Kandamu, uh, which which was called uh, the Mako Kingdom. Uh, but before that, I just wanted to thank again to Cynthia that, that you came and enjoyed our um, presentation uh, this afternoon. So thanks a lot, Cynthia. Thank you for <laughs> inviting me.
<laughs> bye bye. And now we can watch the the trailer of the Mako Kingdom. Enjoy. So this was the trailer of the Mako Kingdom, and here is with us uh, Attila David Molnar, the the director and the co-producer of this uh, film. Hi guys, Team Jungle Society. Um, so he's just calling in for a short time to uh, be with here, and and I just wanted to ask his uh, opinion about this film and uh, his experience in in Peru and making the making of kind of. Uh, <laughs> well, this was a life-changing experience. I mean, I mean, going uh, there into the jungle and not only, uh, 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 how should I say, to a normal tourist destination, but rather to a place which is completely uh, remote and and uh, uninhabited by by people, not only by 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 uh, westerners or. Or, or colonizers, but also the, the aboriginals, the Indians, uh, non-native people were living there. So the, 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 uh, the behavior of the wildlife was amazing, really, really amazing. And this was your first time in, in uh, South America, right? In, in, uh, no, I've been Oklahoma. there uh, several times and I, I, I traveled through mostly when for example, one time when I was traveling to a film expedition to Antarctica, uh -huh. but this was the first uh, time uh, in, in, a, in a real uh, rainforest. And also it was a, a fantastic experience for me to, to, to meet wildlife, which does not afraid of, 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 of which is not afraid of humans. Okay. And, and um, of course you could see animals on Antarctica that were completely tame, but I thought, well, this behavior is simply non-existent on, 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 on elsewhere on the globe. And I was so surprised to, to find out that it's otherwise. Yeah, and in, in the last, uh, in the very last scene of the, the trailer, we saw uh, that the jaguar that, that was like lurking in the dark. And uh, yeah. I just wanted to mention to the viewers that uh, you were actually the, the, the one who, who spotted the jaguar, jaguar that night. Could you just shortly tell the story? How it... <laughs> uh, well, it was just like I was making my way to the loo. It was that simple because, or the banyo as, as, as you guys call it. And, uh, and I tried it to make it very quick because it was getting dark and I thought it's better to be, be as quick as possible. And, 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 and I had a very, just a very weak light on my forehead. Um, uh, and, and it was just one lead, just for reading, you know, in the tent, it's very weak. And I, I, I was making my way on, on the trail and, and all of a sudden I saw these, these glimpses. And, and, and that was so strange because uh, uh, the two points were two 
too far away from each other. I mean, I mean, oh my God, this has to be something big. I, 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 and immediately, I, I, I lay down. And, and I was calling for you. And, and you heard me through your conversation. You were sitting by the, the fire. And I said, Yuri, Yuri, <laughs> Yuri. I remember that. There's something on the banyo. <laughs> the sitting. I mean, she was sitting. She was sitting on the trail. And, and I, I, I can understand afterwards that why she was so pissed off. I mean, we really uh, were intruders and, and we re even made a banyo in her territory. So uh, I can understand her point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah this, this scene was like just amazing that it happened right there. And, and, and we had when we had this uh, film crew, uh, you know, just ready and recording it. Um, and I, I previously was telling uh, today to the viewers that uh, about Kandamo and how special that place is uh, for for the research, and I think this uh, this was just a perfect demonstration of uh, how untouched that that part of of the world is. And I'm really glad that we were able to record and, and show the viewers in in this. Yeah, way. even for even for the native people, right? Yeah, even yeah. Probably also even them, they were surprised. Like, like, they, they, they saw jaguars, a lot lots of jaguars, but all of them. Uh, were just just flee and, and escape yeah. from, from them and, and, yeah. and seeing an, an animal that's so curious like a like really a pussycat and one wanting to come into our camp and I just remember that you had the idea when when she started to walk in the camp which might probably have led to a bloodbath I think but but we tr tried somehow to 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 prevent it and and you had this idea to to uh, uh, to clap um, things together. Yeah, clap, clap together the <laughs> silver bell, right? Yeah. And yeah. I remember a, a dish that was for soup, you know. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, by the end of this, it was completely <laughs> flat, like ah. And the, I think you were quite was, nervous in that. Yeah, the noise was <laughs> so that, big yeah. that we we could scare it away, but only for temporarily, right? Yeah, it was. <laughs> I wonder what what is happening with her right now. I hope she is okay. Yeah. Yeah. Me too probably very calm and, and not many people. Yeah, have but visited. sometimes when, yeah. when you make a film, you have a responsibility um, whether to show such things or not, because if you showed it, I mean, it's not, you know, a television documentary is not only watched by nature enthusiasts, but, but sometimes by poachers or people yeah. who want yeah. to exploit nature. And sometimes I wonder what did we do to that place? And I hope we just, we just uh, did not do any harm. I think we, we made quite a, you know, ra by raising awareness about the, how special that place is and, and really, you know, as the, the previous documentary also did that about the oil extraction. Now we made a point mm -hmm. about like a stronger point in this uh, century or in this millennia now. Uh, mm -hmm. how uh, mm -hmm. it's still it's still like that. And I think it's really it's a it's a good message. And uh, and uh, you know, and like we could also like show this amazing animal to the to the local people. I remember when when we came back, and on the very first night, we we had to do a a, a big projection. Yeah, yeah. And 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 yeah. everyone, all the crew from the, all the research station and and around, they just gathered around the the projector and they watched us as as, as this tigre they call it is is coming to the. To the, to the image and they were laughing a lot because these people are, have a great sense of humor and they were laughing about how afraid uh, freaked out we were and yeah this, yeah this was a great fun <laughs> was just the natural reaction <laughs> yeah from the documentary you don't see it i mean you don't hear the uh, yeah the natural the first reaction because yeah. we just carefully edited those out because sometimes they were you know curses and oh my god how on earth what do we, we do if, if it's coming in <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know i miss that place so much uh, i really wish i were there right now <laughs> yeah yeah and you know I, i'm working a lot on rivers and and for me it was a very great experience to see a river that is completely unpolluted i mean with, mm -hmm. with any kind of trash for for weeks in a row and that was a great experience i remember it quite vividly that how great to be on a place which is which is unpolluted yeah yeah because uh, that you're doing this uh, this big project in hungary right the, the plastic cup where you yeah. cleaning the rivers yeah. with volunteers and 
Yeah, and we, we just work a lot of uh, river pollution. We make documentaries about it. And there, the Kandamu River is completely, of course, clear of pollution. There are other things in it which which are which can be dangerous, right? So yeah, like parasites and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> like trichios and and uh, chim and and, and, and all. rays, even sting rays. I didn't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before. Electric but, electric eels. Yeah, your yeah. rivers have eels and. And also these 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 great stingrays, and you can you can get stung if you if you are not careful enough. Yeah, <laughs> but the most dangerous are the small things, right? Because if you drink the the river water, that can be quite. Tricky. Yeah, you can you can get sick. Yeah, yeah. I remember you made a really good fish soup from this this uh, uh, fruit eating piranha. That was a great. Yeah, fish. we made a Hungarian fish soup. Yeah, <laughs> lots of paprika. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, these days the the in that region, uh, I'm not sure about the Kandamu basin, but like in the upper Tambopata region uh, and within the the Bawakesonana National Park, there are more activities of of uh, narcos like nar narco traffickers, uh, mm -hmm. you know, putting uh, up um, uh, yeah, like landing like... places for the plane and and uh, and some plantations. So. These days in the Tambopata, you can see sometimes some plastic pollution, and you know that cannot come from anywhere from the park naturally, uh, and there's no towns or anything inside. So that's like yeah. a set sign that that some illegal activities are now uh, going on there. And uh, I I wrote about that in our blog on Wildlife Messengers. That's now up mm -hmm. on the website. Mm -hmm. And so, so for example, plastic bottles come downstream. Yeah, like like big plastic, you know, like um, like a um, tarp or yeah, mm -hmm. just plastic pieces or or barrels, plastic barrels that they use for. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, that's sad, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the first uh, instruction when we entered Kandamu. That just be careful because we're probably not alone. Yeah. yeah. I'm sad to hear that it's it's always a, a very vulnerable thing for for wildlife to survive, and that means that those guys must hunt. Uh, yeah. they, I'm sure they they use weapons for 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 a fresh daily meat of meal meat, and, yeah. and uh, I'm so sorry. Maybe or tigre meat people like this after us. At least we didn't do any harm. And we we personally didn't leave anything behind. Yeah, mentioned that two uh, spoons that uh, Tinti accidentally threw into uh, the dropped. Room, right? <laughs> but that was not plastic. <laughs> no, that was metal. But that's the way Tinti washes, make make makes the dishes. Disappear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, actually, that since I think since last year or or maybe two years ago now, all the the protected areas in Peru, including Tambopata, made this big uh, regulation that you cannot bring in any plastic, uh, you know, uh, single-use plastic. Which means also like you cannot bring in um, like a, a pet uh, plastic bat bottles to the park, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, only glass or recycled stuff. So. Yeah, that's a it's a good thing. And then... Well, sometimes plastic is not a bad thing because in Tambopata is also sub supplied by by uh, uh, small motor boats, right? And and yeah. when you have a heavier cargo, then yeah. then the consumption increases. So sometimes it's more environmental friendly to use plastic, but make sure that the plastic goes back to the place where. It yeah, started. exactly. And yeah, it's just yeah. not the trouble. Yeah. So thank you very much, Ati, for calling in. Um, it was really cool yeah, to see thanks you. Thanks for calling. It was great to watch this trailer. It was a uh, time travel. <laughs> yeah, time travel back to to Kandamu time. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye, Bye, guys. So since this documentary series, we also worked on others, and you can check those out on our website, wildlifemessengers.org. And I also worked on some of the landmark documentary series uh, of the Natural History Unit of the BBC. Uh, you might have seen the Earth's Great Rivers, where we worked on the, the episode about the Amazon, or the most recent Attenborough series, The Seven Worlds, One Planet, uh, where in the South America episode, uh, you might remember the Moko uh, scene that we filmed in Tambopata. Uh, I think. Um, 
and that all these um, series about wildlife and the documentaries that we make with wildlife messengers as well about the issues around conservation are very important tools actually for conservation itself to raise awareness about these things, about the issues and, and show all the wildlife that we left uh, and um, you know that to raise awareness and empathy in the people, in the audience who watch and hopefully engage uh, in the conservation of these species and not the destructive activities uh, that's going uh, around the world these days. Um, and we would like to continue these, this work, of course, at Wildlife Messengers. And uh, we still focus not only on parrots, uh, on other species as well, uh, but since I also did a lot of research on parrots, we would also like to do some more documentaries about them that might be um, in your interest. Um, and I would like to share my uh, screen here uh, to show you a little bit of uh, information about parrots to actually understand that uh, we really need to, you know, respect all these species because they've been around for many, many years and much uh, before, uh, much more time before we humans actually um, existed. Uh, so the origins of parrots, uh, there are some, uh, we don't know exactly uh, when the first parrot originated, but there are some, uh, some of the researchers think that uh, they already in the latest Cretaceous period, uh, we uh, had parrots on earth. Uh, and this is based on a fossil uh, of a lower mandible that some researcher thinks that that belonged to a parrot. Uh, while other researchers think that it's actually uh, part of the lower mandible of a dinosaur, not, not a, a parrot. So we're not sure exactly, but phylogenetic analysis uh, did the origin of the order of Cetaciformes somewhere about the, the Cretaceous tertiary period. So somewhere in the time when dinosaurs went extinct, which was a really, really long time ago, you know, like uh, around 65 million years ago. Very interestingly, though, we have some uh, real parrot fossils uh, from the early and the late Eocene. You can see here on the graph, um, you know, these are around uh, between 55 to 49 million years ago uh, from England, uh, which is uh, in the Northern Hemisphere in, in Europe. And also from England, we have another uh, parrot uh, fossil uh, that dates around 41 to 34 million years ago. So these are from the Eocene epoch. Um, and we have also some other uh, fossils from the Miocene, uh, some cockatoo species from Australia, uh, some other, uh, the Archaeopsitacus one from France, which is also in Europe, um, and some other uh, from the late uh, Pliocene from Argentina. Um, and just putting in context, you know, where humans originated, uh, it's uh, the, the last common ancestor, as uh, Cynthia also mentioned in uh, her talk, uh, with the chimpanzees, it, uh, existed around uh, five, six million years ago. Uh, so around uh, that time in the time scale. So you see uh, the parrots being around the earth much earlier uh, than us humans. So they really deserve this planet much uh, more than us. So uh, we really need to uh, look out of them and, um, and protect them. And of course, for other wildlife, I'm just talking here about parrot uh, in, uh, specifically. And if you put uh, the, the origin of parrot uh, on a global map, a global scale, uh, that how Earth actually looked in those times. So this is a time that we suspect that the parrots originated from. So that's around uh, the Cretaceous time, 65 million years ago. Uh, Earth something looked like this. And we know uh, 
that the pirates have a Gondwanan origin, which means that they originated from the southern uh, supercontinent, which is uh, now if you, think, think, you can think of like Australia, the origin of pirates, Australia and Antarctica, and then they radiated to South America and Africa to the north. So that's why I mentioned uh, and highlighted in the previous slide that it's really interesting that we have uh, the earliest pirate fossils from Europe, like France and, and England, uh, because that was actually part of Laurasia, which is the northern uh, supercontinent. Um, so this, uh, this is a bit um, interesting and confusing, uh, but uh, maybe it's just because we haven't found uh, other pirate fossils or haven't looked enough to other uh, locations and also uh, they uh, can be very fragile. You, know, you can think of the, the little bones that like these and um, many of these uh, species don't actually fossilize so well. So it's just really hard. You need to be really lucky to find uh, some fossils from, from that uh, era. Uh, but as of today, we don't have any parrot species uh, living uh, in Europe. Uh, and I mean like uh, that, uh, that was uh, endemic to Europe. Uh, we of course have some of the, the feral populations that uh, got introduced uh, to many large cities in Europe, like the rose ring parakeets or the monk parakeets that are now thriving in many uh, European cities. But these uh, species are actually not uh, native to Europe, so they, uh, they were not originated from here. And um, finally, I would like to talk a little bit about, more specifically, about the diversity of the macaws. So this is a group uh, within uh, within the the parrots, the psittaciformes, but it's a not not really well defined group phylogeni phylogenetically. Uh, but uh, if you think of macaws, everyone uh, kind of can imagine that these are the large uh, macaws with, with, with the large beaks and um, they, uh, they can only find, of course, in the neotropics, so only in the tropical region of the Americas. Um, and as of today, we have uh, many species that are uh, threatened, so some kind of, uh, they, they facing some kind of uh, severed threat, like they could be critically endangered, endangered or vulnerable. Uh, we have one species, the Spixis macaw, that uh, extinct in the wild. Uh, and now uh, many people are working to reintroduce them to Brazil. Uh, but unfortunately, some of the other species were not so lucky and uh, gone extinct and haven't seen for, uh, for uh, many, many years. For example, the Glaucus macaw uh, from Bolivia that lived there originally. Um, and if you look at the map, you can see that many of the extinct uh, parrot species uh, actually uh, from the Caribbean region. Uh, but many of these, we, we are actually not so sure that they ever existed. The only species that we have like specimens uh, in the museum is the, the Cuban macaw, the Ara tricolor, as you can see here, um, that inhabited uh, Cuba and probably Jamaica as well. And there are some other four or some other things even more like maybe 10 other species that could have existed uh, in the pre-human uh, or the pre-colonization time of the Caribbean uh, region. Uh, so this is a very interesting so story and uh, if they existed, why so many species, really uh, so many spe species existed there or not, uh, the only source uh, that we have, as I mentioned already, of course, the Cuban macaw, uh, and these are all the other suspected species that uh, 
once uh, could have existed in the Caribbean regions in the West or the East Indies. Um, the first evidence was published by archaeologists from France uh, near Guadeloupe uh, Island. They uh, found uh, in uh, they find like calves of uh, macaws that uh, was originated in a layer that is from the Pleistocene period. So that's like the, the last ice age, uh, around uh, more than 10,000 uh, uh, years ago. And that time, uh, people did not live in the Caribbean region. So this is the first evidence that uh, in that region, in the East Indies, um, Mokos uh, actually existed in that region. Uh, and other uh, sources um, are, of course, the, the after Columbus uh, arrived to the, to the region and then many other uh, European uh, discoverers described in the, in the uh, books and documents and drawings, as you can see some of them here, um, that uh, they described some parrots and macaws that we don't have any record uh, in the modern uh, day. But uh, other methods like modern DNA techniques, like ancient DNA techniques, can uh, actually investigate uh, some of the some of the fossils or subfossil remains that uh, might have been found, just like the the one on the picture uh, find near Guadeloupe. Um, and this is a very interesting question because uh, we don't really know why macaws gone extinct in the Caribbean uh, in such a massive number if they really existed as so many species. And, uh, and this can also show us or, or teach us something about the present day extinction and extinction risk um, of uh, not only uh, the present day macaws and parrots, but also for other species. So at Wildlife Messengers, we came up with this idea to actually show this really interesting and, and uh, very, again, a multidisciplinary kind of research uh, story and, and history uh, involved as well in a new documentary uh, that we would like to call something like the extinct macaws of the Caribbean. And uh, as uh, we already done with uh, other um, documentaries before, like the Macaw Project. Uh, you know, it's not easy these days to find uh, support or budget uh, for a production of a film. And for this one, we don't really have uh, recorded uh, materials yet from this region. So we started uh, again, crowdfunding uh, campaign, just like many, many years ago. Uh, for the Maka project as the whole wildlife messenger started uh, after that documentary. And uh, uh, we would like to invite you uh, to check it out. It's wildlifemessengers.org slash extingmakos. And if you go to that website of ours, you can see more detailed information uh, about this uh, documentary, what we would like to do here, basically, the would film in the different regions, the different islands of the Caribbean and uh, film with the researchers uh, who find, for example, these uh, remains uh, of the first macaws of the Caribbeans. You want to film in some of the museums that still host uh, uh, these uh, Cuban macaw specimens. And, uh, and also make interviews not only with scientists uh, and museologists, uh, archaeologists, uh, but also parrot researchers about their opinion um, about why these macaws disappeared, what they think if they existed. And also it would be some kind of investigative documentary uh, story about going to these locations and also talk to the locals, uh, the local people uh, and see what they have to say about what what they recollection of memory, their history, they maybe they legend say something about these macaws if they have any uh, information, more information that uh, maybe has not been published in the scientific literature. Um, 
and uh, make a documentary about uh, what we can find. So this is very exciting because we don't really know what we will find. We hope to also do some kind of scientific research on this, as I mentioned, maybe some ancient DNA research and, and comparison of the, the genetic material of the Cuban macaw uh, and today existing macaws and see how closely they uh, are related with the ones that previously find uh, just some remains uh, on the Caribbean islands. And then show you in this, in an interesting uh, documentary about the Caribbean region and try to kind of recollect uh, with specific uh, uh, effect on the film, uh, how, the, how these islands might have looked like in the past before Columbus or even before the first uh, Caribs, the first indigenous people who uh, inhabited uh, the, the region um, from Central America, from uh, South America, uh, many of these tribes came and some uh, uh, suggests that even from Florida, they, they came to inhabit these regions and uh, some of the ideas that, that actually they took uh, macaws, uh, feed them as pets and they actually introduced these birds to the, to the region. So there's, there's lots of uh, missing data. We don't know there are lots of hypotheses that could be done. And we would really like to, to uh, you know, just go around all these uh, stories and hypotheses and, and, and show which is the, the uh, most probable, what the evidence shows and what the scientists, experts and local people have to say. And of course, the old documents uh, that uh, the, the first discoverers, the, um, the first uh, Europeans uh, had to write about, about these uh, birds in the Caribbean region. So um, anyway, I just wanted to uh, introduce this uh, new documentary uh, proposal for you. If you're interested, please visit our site, wildlifemessengers.org slash extinctmocos. And please uh, share this with your friends that you might be interested as well in such a documentary. And if you have any questions, um, of course, um, not only uh, the macaws uh, of this uh, uh, particular uh, documentary, but also uh, about um, my research or wildlife messengers or just uh, uh, wildlife documentary films in general, uh, you can find us uh, on wildlifemessengers.org and you can find our uh, contact details on that as well. And on that note, I thank you very much for your attention today. I hope you enjoyed uh, these videos and uh, uh, I hope you will watch some of our documentaries uh, and, uh, and uh, hopefully we see each other soon in the future and not just in this digital world this digital platform. Thanks very much and enjoy your evening.